The sport of cycling is facing up to the biggest crisis in its history. Lance Armstrong, no longer a serial winner, but a serial cheat. Al Jazeera has been talking exclusively to the doctor who's accused of, but denies doping him. I never seen any doping practice from Lance Armstrong. We'll have reaction to Dr. Ferrari's claims of innocence and conspiracy and ask how much damage the Armstrong scandal has done to the sport. I think cycling is moving towards the edge of the cliff. Uh, if it is not very, very careful, I think it'll go over that cliff. I hope that doesn't happen. We'll also be investigating if the sport really can change its culture and restore its shattered image. That's all to come in this Al Jazeera special as we ask, has cycling been peddling a lie? Lance Armstrong's career and reputation unraveled in a matter of weeks. The narrative of a cancer survivor who went on to win seven Tour de France titles, replaced by the story of a man who'd lied and doped throughout his career. Obviously, it's been an interesting, and as I said the other night, at times very difficult few weeks. Um, people ask me a lot, how you doing? And I tell them, I say, well, I've been better, but I've also been worse. Well, in June 2012, the United States Anti-Doping Agency accused Armstrong of doping and trafficking drugs. Two months later, Armstrong dropped his defence, opting for silence rather than facing the testimony of former teammates in court. USADA's 1,000-page report said Armstrong was a serial cheat who led the most sophisticated, professionalised and successful doping programme that sports has ever seen. When you violate the rules of sport, that, that, that's contrary to the very definition of what sport is. And when you rip apart the ethical underpinnings of what sport is supposed to be, sport to a certain extent becomes meaningless. Well, in October, cycling's world governing body, the UCI, confirmed that Armstrong would be stripped of his record seven tour titles. He was also given a life ban from the sport. UCI president Pat McQuaid said Armstrong had no place in cycling and he was sickened by the details contained in that USADA report. If I have to apologise now on behalf of the UCI, what I will say is that I am sorry that we couldn't catch every damn one of them red-handed and throw them out of the sport. The man himself, well, he hasn't come close to admitting any guilt. Armstrong saying the USADA investigation was an unconstitutional witch hunt and pointing out he'd never failed a doping test. The 41-year-old has, though, resigned from his Livestrong cancer charity, an effort, he says, to spare it from controversy. Pivotal to the story is an Italian doctor, Michele Ferrari. He's accused of doping Armstrong and his Tour de France teammates. Dr Ferrari is repeatedly referred to in the US Anti-Doping Agency report and has been banned for life by them. He's also the subject of a criminal investigation in his native Italy. Ferrari, though, insists he's innocent. Al Jazeera's Lee Wellings has been talking exclusively to the man charged with being the most controversial doper in the history of sport. Dr. Michele Ferrari is at the centre of the report that condemned Lance Armstrong. And in July, the US Anti-Doping Agency, or USADA, issued Ferrari a lifetime sports ban for numerous doping violations. The doctor confirmed to Al Jazeera that he worked as Armstrong's medical consultant throughout much of his career. But is adamant both he and Armstrong are innocent. I never seen any doping practice from Lance Armstrong. I can say I never seen, I never heard something about that. And uh, my uh, and uh, he never asked me uh, information or or uh, about doping. Okay. And there are six, six riders that accused me. And, uh, but these, these riders, uh, I, I didn't have any relationship, any consulting with these guys. Since I started with cyclists 30 years ago, I uh, had a 
consulting with hundreds of professional cyclists. Over 30 years, just few athletes accused me of something illegal or related with doping. And all these few guys have a reason, had a reason to do that. So how do you convince people that you are telling the truth? What I can say about the USAD investigation is that there are no evidence, uh, in particular no evidence against me, um, but I can say also there are no evidence, uh, no smoking gun, no sm smoking gun about, about the, the accusations. Probably what I can suppose is that some of these athletes, the federal investigation was able to demonstrate their, their doping practice, who they organized by themselves. And uh, to save themselves, they agree with the user the conspirations, as I say in the user investigation. But that US anti-doping agency report did contain seemingly damning eyewitness testimony from 11 of Armstrong's former United States Postal Service teammates who claimed Dr. Ferrari was brought to several USPS training camps. Dr. Ferrari developed a distinctive mixture of testosterone and olive oil to be administered under the tongue to assist in recovery during races and training. This mixture was known among team members as the oil. Dr. Ferrari also advised riders on the use of the banned oxygen enhancer erythropoietin EPO, with detailed instructions regarding clearance times, how the EPO drug test worked, and how to avoid detection of the drug. Dr. Ferrari was present and assisted during instances of prohibited blood doping and EPO use by USPS team members. Dr. Ferrari developed detailed training schedules for riders which included coded symbols designating when EPO should be used and the amount of the drug to inject. Ferrari felt more comfortable responding to these USADA claims in his native Italian. My job consists essentially, I would like to say exclusively, of advising athletes of the best way to train and proposing alternatives, perfectly legal alternatives, to the use of doping substances. High altitude training, for instance, rather than using erythropoietin EPO. And also the use of nutrition in a targeted way. This can be confirmed by the majority of the athletes who've been working with me. My job has nothing to do with doping, but is substantially the job of consulting and proposing alternatives to doping. Why do you think the US Anti-Doping Agency would pick on you? I don't know the reason. I can imagine that over the years I've become a convenient target and I've been used in the investigations against Lance Armstrong. It's a fact that within the US Postal and Discovery Channel teams, there was not one case of a positive anti-doping test. Some athletes who were with Lance Armstrong and then changed teams were positive in the case of Floyd Landis or Tyler Hamilton, but not within the US Postal team. Why do you think Lance Armstrong chose not to fight the USADA verdict against him? I presume it's due to tiredness and refusal to continue this story which has been going on for ages, 10, 12 years, accusations about doping which have not been proven. You can see more of that exclusive interview with Dr. Ferrari on our website. Check out aljazeera.com forward slash sports. Now, a man with a rather different take on Lance Armstrong is his former US Postal teammate, Tyler Hamilton. Hamilton says drugs were an accepted part of cycling throughout his career and that he blood doped alongside Armstrong. He told Al Jazeera, 
Armstrong privately admitted to actually failing a drug test, but says that result was never likely to go public. Lance informed me in um, June of 2001, uh, during the tour of Switzerland, uh, that he had tested positive, uh, I believe, the day before. And, um, you know, we were about to start, I, think, I believe it was stage number nine of the tour of Switzerland, and he told me everything was going to be taken care of and that not to worry, basically. Back in the dark era of cycling, you know, 10, 12 years ago, uh, when I was riding, you know, I would say minimum, you know, if not more, 80% of the peloton was doping to some degree um, at the elite level. Um, so, yeah, there was 20% or 15% that were not doping. Yeah, they were, they were cheated. And, you know, I'll never forgive myself. And, you know, I'd been lying for years. Um, but I had to testify in front of the grand jury. Um, there was a federal investigation uh, happening. Uh, they were investigating both the U.S. Postal Service cycling team and Lance Armstrong. Um, I was subpoenaed, uh, went in by myself, spoke in front of the grand jury, and uh, the first time I had told the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Um, and at that point, I realized there was only one way to go in my life, and that was just coming out and telling the whole truth. And um, that, that day has been, you know, one of the best days of my life. All my, you know, old trophies and medals and leaders' jerseys from special races, and that's all, those are all in boxes you know, packed away and, um, you know, even, even when I had a gold medal, you know, I didn't, that was packed away as well. Um, I don't look back, I don't look at myself as a ex-professional cyclist really anymore. I, I, you know, um, hopefully I'll be remembered as some, for something else. Hopefully, you know, somebody who, who made some, some bad choices in their life and uh, went on to fix them and went on to tell the truth and hopefully a lot of people can learn from, from my mistakes. Unfortunately for cycling, Hamilton's words fit into a disturbing story arc. The Tour de France has a doping history as long as the event itself. Alcohol, painkillers, stimulants, even small doses of poison have all been used, pushing some competitors up and through this gruelling three-week race. A year after drug testers first arrived at the Tour came the death of Tom Simpson. The Briton collapsed and died near the summit of the infamous Mont Ventoux in 1967. Simpson had suffered heart failure brought on by heat exhaustion, but a post-mortem also found amphetamines and alcohol in his blood. The 1970s saw steroids being used for the first time, and Michel Pelontier was just one rider experimenting with new ways of avoiding detection. When asked to provide a urine sample for a drug test, he was caught trying to fill his sample bottle using a synthetic bladder, better known to us as a condom, that contained clean urine. The 1998 race is known as the Tour of Shame. Festina, then the world's number one team, thrown out of the Tour days after their physio was caught with various doping products in his car. Festina's sports director, Bruno Rissell, admitted he'd organised doping throughout the team. And that led on to the Lance Armstrong era, an era in which cycling's world governing body, the UCI, has been heavily criticised for their failure to rid the sport of doping. The UCI boss, Pat McQuaid, cancelled a scheduled interview with Al Jazeera to respond to the issues raised in this programme. One person who was willing to talk was Greg LeMond, who is viewed by many as one of the last truly clean winners of the Tour de France. Le Mans claimed the title three times between 1986 and 1990 and after the Armstrong scandal is now the only American to have officially won the tour. Le Mans has said he would run for the presidency of cycling's governing body, the UCI, if that could help restore the sport's reputation. He told Al Jazeera just what he thought of Dr Ferrari's denial of any wrongdoing. I think it's incredibly damaging because um, Dr. Fryer has been in practice, I guess, since uh, the 80s. And it's been widely known when I was racing, um, people who were with him, it was dramatic, dramatic difference in performance. Um, but then there was huge drug scandal in 1998, which we had a chance to clean up the sport. And then everybody wanted to put it behind us. Um, every year there has been another scandal. And it's a few people, just a few people that are really... Um, uh, disrupting the system and it's it all has to do with financial gain um, and and essentially basically well cheating and Dr. Ferrari is well known to be uh, a master at uh, doping. <laughs>
If Ferrari puts down the boosts in performance he can produce to nutrition and training techniques, but within cycling, many have reacted with scepticism to those claims. I would agree, and I, I don't believe there's enough scientific evidence out there that there's very little um, evidence of, of performance increase through nutrition. Um, you know, I, I, it's uh, even people that took antioxidants, um, a tremendous amount early 90s, it shows that the uh, cells actually had, it, were damaged by the um, artificial antioxidants. Your body produces a lot of stuff naturally that uh, uh, it's, it still gets to back to physiology 101. Uh, that's, a, that's really a, a, a kind of a, a, a cover for, for doping. Greg, have to ask this question. Were you ever tempted to dope during your career? I'd rather uh, not win a race than be positive. I mean, just it, it, it's it's winning a race where you're mass, you're cheating. It's kind of like taking a uh, a shortcut to the finish line. I mean, do you really win the race? And uh, so, I mean, I I I was very. Uh, I think the end of my career when I watched a rider of our, my team leave and he ended up dying just right after I left. Uh, it put a. Uh, it wasn't even about. It wasn't about me getting cheated out of performance. It was watching uh, a human tragedy go on with all these riders. And, uh, and I was saying that the riders themselves, there's one constant here. The riders keep changing. Every five, 10 years, there's new riders. But one thing that hasn't changed is the same doctors are in there. People think, oh, well, you know, just let them take whatever they want. But these riders, they're, in a way, we're all like kids. Uh, we want parents to put the limits on us. We want to bounce up to those limits uh, like kids want to, but in the end, we, we all like that there's, there's something that's putting a brake on everybody. And, um, and I think that most riders never intend to get into onto the, in bike racing or any sport with the intention of doping. And, uh, and that's where I think it, it needs to come from the top. The change has to come from the top. Well, talking of the top, Greg, and I'm quoting here, the UCI say that today's riders are subject to the most innovative and effective anti-doping measures in sports. But you still see there being some big problems there. The problem is um, the credibility and the trust that's in there. Uh, when, when you have leaders of, of the governing body favoring um, and willing to accept uh, money from athletes that are uh, subject to a uh, suspicion of doping, um, it's inappropriate. And that's ethically crosses boundaries. And so that's the lack of trust, which also creates chaos within the peloton, within the riders. Now, an independent panel has been set up to investigate the role of the UCI during the Armstrong scandal. Do you have any confidence in that process? I would have more faith if they would cooperate with WADA and USADA and the government. Um, and hopefully they will they'll consider that because I think that this is a bigger uh, investigation than just uh, uh, looking through the books or like a, uh, an accounting uh, going in for an a audit. It, it, it takes talking to people and it has to be done in a way that is neutral. I, I do believe that at least in the interim, um, the president of the UCI should uh, resign or at least temporarily resign while the investigation goes on. I think that would be a great step. And, and I, it would, I would give him credit for that because I think he should do that for the sport. In a funny way though, is this also an opportunity for cycling? Do you think there's a momentum for change now? Uh, absolutely, and it's it's not having to rip, rip apart all of the UCI. It's it's bringing in a new leader, um, and really talking. To, I mean, working with the riders, working with the organizers, and looking at the best solution to to assure that there's a, a, a neutrality in drug testing. And it can't be done in house. It has to be out. It has to be independent. And if that happens, I think credibility can come back quickly to uh, cycling. Greg Armstrong is obviously still insisting he is innocent, but if he was to come out and tell a rather different story, would a confession be cleansing for the sport? Well, I think that's the greatest contribution uh, Lance could ever make to cycling. And uh, I, 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 part of me wants to believe that that'll happen, um, but usually it takes until you've lost everything, um, very similar to what happened to Floyd Landis. Um, but I think that uh, there's there's always that chance uh, for whatever he's motivated by. It, it doesn't matter if he could um, come out and uh, show the system because he's he got he got away with 12 years of, of stuff that you know nobody else really got away with. And it would be nice to know um, how you can use that information to prevent this ever from happening again.
so with only three Tour de France's since 1995 having been won by riders who've not been involved in drug controversies, the sport is facing a huge fight to restore its reputation. But doping isn't, of course, just restricted to cycling. In this report, Charlotte Whale looks at what's next for cycling and at the wider fight against drug use in sport. In the world of competitive sport, there's one race that doesn't stop. It's a contest between the athletes who choose to take drugs and the people out to catch them. Le vainqueur du Tour de France 2005, Lance Armstrong. The Lance Armstrong scandal is a timely reminder of just how tough that contest is. I think cycling is moving towards the edge of the cliff. Uh, if it is not very, very careful and if it's not totally honest about uh, and uh, totally willing to uh, mend its ways, I think it'll go over that cliff. I hope that doesn't happen. We have a sport that is metaphorically in the toilet. It's suffered scandal after scandal. The credibility is shot to pieces. The recent cycling scandal and the sport's history of doping shame has raised the question of whether a federation can be both policeman and promoter. Members of new group Change Cycling Now are demanding the sport's leadership stand down and instead have an independent body to impose strict anti-doping controls. We've tried to picture what we want the sport to look like in three to five years. And if we can achieve that, if we can show that you can turn a sport around like this and make it the shining star of the sports firmament, then it'll be an example for other sports as to how they can better treat the doping issue and also be better administered. There'll be a lot of scrutiny on any efforts to restore the sport's reputation that many say is damaged almost beyond repair. But doping is not just a problem facing cycling. Uh, if it can be so sophisticated, so hidden, as the Armstrong case demonstrated, then you have to ask yourself, where else is this happening? Uh, are we catching all the cheats? I know we're not. But many do get picked up, and that's largely thanks to scientists coming up with new ways to detect the latest performance-enhancing drugs available to athletes. Globally, there are 33 laboratories backed by the World Anti-Doping Agency. These are the machines that are mainly gas chromatography machines. Uh... Labs like these independently test blood and urine samples, but the system is far from standardised across sport. It's the federations or the Olympic committees or the anti-doping agency in the country that is in charge of taking the samples from the athletes, sending them to us, and we analyze them, report the results back to them. They are the, the people who make the decision on sanctioning or not sanctioning or uh, punishment. As technology gets smarter, samples stored in these labs get retested, and athletes who thought they'd got away with it will find they haven't. Earlier this year, five Olympians who competed in Athens in 2004 tested positive for drugs that weren't detected the first time. And six athletes from the 2008 Beijing Games were picked up about a year after the event. Those who competed in the London Olympics can expect the same scrutiny. But what is Chief John Fahey says there's got to be more than just science to catch cheats. We've got to be smarter in the way we do it and that means working in collaboration with police forces and uh, pharmaceutical companies is another way of, of making sure we know what's out there before it gets out there. Next year, Fahey says he hopes what is revised code will include a mandate for more blood tests and stronger incentives for whistleblowers, but even that, he admits, is not enough. While WADA can provide a framework for the rules, it's down to each sport's governing body to enforce them. And the question remains, will those who stand to profit from sporting success ever properly deal with doping? A reminder that to listen to extended versions of the interviews in this programme, you can visit our website, aljazeera.com forward slash sport. Plus, there's details there of how you can get in touch with our team via social networking, including Facebook and Twitter. We want to know what you think about the Tour de France's future and when the 2013 race gets underway in June, will you really believe what you're seeing or do you think cycling is still peddling a lie?